Hello friends and welcome back to the shop. Today is Sunday, March 20th and it is an absolutely beautiful March day here in southeastern Pennsylvania. It's in the 50s, a little cloudy, rained yesterday, but it's a nice day today. So hopefully going to get out and enjoy a little bit of that uh, this afternoon. We shall see. Well, I hope you're all doing well this Sunday. I've got my J. Mouton Lavat with some Haunted Bookshop. This is going to be my Sunday pipe for a while until I get it broken in. Really enjoying it. So, we've got... Um, buckle in, this one's going to be a ride. <laughs> so we've been talking for the past couple weeks, and, and this video really is part three in a three-part series that... I wasn't intending when I made the first video, but the comments have driven me to this and, and, and I've really enjoyed it. You know, it's been an interesting thing to think through for myself and I hope it's been interesting for you to hear about. So we started off um, three weeks back talking about the seeming impossibility of our own existence in, in, in not, not you know, we obviously exist, but in the idea that, you know, our parents' meeting was very unlikely and their parents' meeting was very unlikely, and you go back and you start to add up all these probabilities and you, you get something that approaches zero as you come to you. And, you know, people found it interesting and one or two folks said, well, you know, that's ignoring, you know, you're, you're saying it's random chance, but you're ignoring the hand of God and all that. And I, I agree. I, I was ignoring it. Uh, the video last week was talking more about complexity in the world and how we deal with it from a scientific point of view. Um, you know, the idea of randomness and the idea of complex systems and, uh, you know, trying to make sense of those. And, you know, I tried to make the point that a lot of the times we have to make these uh, simplifying assumptions in order to make sense of the world. Here's my lighter. And we do this in all aspects of our life, and it's a completely reasonable thing to do, but we shouldn't forget that we're making these simplifying assumptions. So today I'm going to try to put those two things together and talk a bit about these, this concept. And if you, you saw the intro slide, you, you have heard, you've, you've at least seen this term, and you've probably heard it. And that's deus ex machina. Deus ex machina is a Greek, uh, well, actually, actually it's a Latin phrase. Um, it means God from the machine. Okay, God out of the machine. It's actually borrowed from the Greek phrase epomechanis theos which again means uh, out of the machine comes God uh, or something, something similar to that. And if you know this phrase, you probably know it in the context of uh, Greek uh, drama, tragedies, where there's you know, an event where it just seems impossible that the situation can be resolved. And all of a sudden, one of the gods comes riding in in a chariot and changes the outcome. Uh, so it's this idea that, you know, some, some external force, not necessarily God, uh, as it's used in modern parlance, but some external force uh, unexpectedly comes in and resolves the plot in, in, in uh, theatrical terms. And there's some good examples of this. Um, it's a nice Wikipedia article on it if you're interested. Just, you know, Google Deus Ex Machina. I do do research for these. Uh, but, you know, two of the examples that were pointed out were um, the eagles that are used throughout Tolkien's uh, works, the, the Lord of the Rings, and I think the Hobbit, although I don't remember for certain. And I'm talking about the books here. Um, you know, the, 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 the fellowship is in an impossible situation, or a portion of the fellowship. And, uh, you know, how are they possible? And all of a sudden, these eagles swoop in, and they jump on their backs, and they fly away. You know, so the eagles are the deus ex machina in that sense. 
another one that's that's really interesting and, and actually quite appropriate is uh, the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones movie, where the Ark itself winds up being the Deus Ex Machina, where you know the, Indiana Jones and whatever his lady's name was, <laughs> I don't remember. Are you know they, they've been completely captured and defeated by the Nazis, and the Nazis have the Ark, and it you know it's game over. But then when they open the Ark, God intercedes, and you know everything's fine. Uh, well, not for the Nazis, but <laughs> for for India, India and his his lady. So this is a concept that we're all familiar with, uh, but it's a concept that we actually use a lot. Now, if you look back at the Greek tragedies, you know, and you've got the, you know, all these gods and they take a very, very personal interest in the happenings in the story and they, they reach in and they, they change things and all that. And, you know, it's easy to look back at that and, and people say, oh, you know, these primitive people, they, they, they believed in these things and they, they made this stuff up to make sense of their world. And, you know, I've heard it claimed by atheists um, that, you know, all believers, whether they be yeah, anyone that believes in a creator, let's just put it that way to be general. Um, they, they're just, you know, they're, they're primitive thinking. They're just trying to make sense of their world. They don't understand the science. You know? Well, I've got two things to say to that. Um, the first is that ancient people were not stupid. You know, just because they lived a long time ago doesn't mean that they were stupid. Uh, the Greeks are responsible for an amazing number of, of advances that we still use today in our modern world. And they were making these advances at a time when they were believing in this polytheistic religion. So mathematics, geometry, astronomy, medicine, categorical biology, very interesting area, philosophy, government, you know, where do you think we get the concept of democracy, architecture, if, if you have not, if you have not had the opportunity to actually stand in front of a Greek temple, and I fortunately have, it's astonishing, you know, to think about how long ago these things were built, and, and they're just amazing structures. And that's just the Greeks. You know, we could talk about the Babylonians, of course, the Romans, the, the, the Egyptians. Um, these were not stupid people. They've done things that we still don't understand how, how they were done. So don't dismiss their beliefs or a belief in God. I don't want to, I'm not in any way arguing that, that, that the polytheistic Greek religion was, was the, the true path. So I'm just saying don't dismiss it because you think they're primitive or they don't have the mental capacity to think as well as you do because you're wrong. They were smart. They were smarter than you, most likely. Smarter than me, for sure. The second thing I would say to that criticism is your faith in science, and it is faith, is in a sense, in a very real sense, no different than my faith in God. It, it really isn't. Science, and I'm a scientist. I've been a scientist my whole life, my whole career, uh, you know, coming up on 30 years. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm credentialed. I'm, I'm not a theologist, I'm not a philosopher, but I am a biologist, a uh, biophysicist, and I've published in top journals. I'm internationally recognized. You know, I, I, I travel to international conferences and give talks. I'm asked to give talks. Uh, I'm not blowing my own horn here. I'm just trying to point out that I'm not just some guy talking about science. And I'm employed by a company who, if I told you their name, you'd recognize it. And I'm employed to do science. Uh, and I do it every day, and they appreciate what I do. So I kind of know science, and I love science. You know, it's, it's what I've spent my life doing. But it sits on shaky ground, and any good scientist will tell you that that's the case. There are assumptions, a lot of assumptions, some that we can't test, and we put our faith in them. Um, I talked last week about observational science. Cosmology was the example I used. It doesn't lend itself to hypothesis testing. 
you know, when I, as a biologist, run an experiment, I design a very controlled set of circumstances and I observe what happens. And I say, okay, does that fit with my hypothesis? If not, I change my hypothesis. I change the experiment to test the new hypothesis and I do it again. And I do that over. It's an iterative process that hopefully will eventually get you to the truth. You can't do that in cosmology. You can't make two galaxies collide and see what happens. You have to wait for it to happen and just observe it. You can't modify uh, that experiment. So it's, it's not really uh, lending itself to hypothesis testing, other than you can make a hypothesis what happens when two galaxies collide and then wait for it to happen and see if it fits your hypothesis. And as we talked last week, if it doesn't, you make a new hypothesis, but you just accept, they just accept it. I don't accept it. <laughs> uh, they can't test it until an event occurs that in which it can be tested, or at least it can be observed. Another problem with science, and, and again, I'm a scientist and I, I have faith in, in the scientific method. I do think it helps us understand the world. But the second problem is that you cannot test you, you cannot prove a negative, and you can't do this in, in life. I mean, you just simply cannot prove a negative. And, you know, so you can try and prove, for example, that God exists. But you can't prove that he doesn't. It's impossible, logically impossible. Uh, you can try and prove that if you take uh, more calcium in in your diet, you'll have stronger bones. But you can't prove that calcium doesn't strengthen bones. Again, it's logically impossible. It doesn't matter what you're trying to prove. You cannot prove a negative. This goes back to a, well, one of the reasons you can't prove a negative. There's actually several. But the one that I'm most interested in is, is um, the work of a guy named Karl Popper, who was, I believe, an Australian philosopher. And he pointed out that <clears throat> in terms of causality, no matter how confident you are that A causes B, it doesn't matter what A and B are. You know, let's say uh, I want to come up with a relatively simple example. <clears throat> let's, okay, it's going to be a somewhat silly example, but uh, two billiard balls are rolling and one is still and one is, I'm sorry, one billiard ball is rolling and the other one is still and they collide and the first billiard ball that's moving stops and the one that it was not moving rolls away. Well, what caused billiard ball number two to roll away? Well, billiard ball number one hit it and imparted energy, kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy of billiard ball one was, was converted to kinetic energy in billiard ball two. And that's the cause of it rolling away. Okay, so what Popper says is you can, you can believe that, but you can always put something in the middle. You could always say billiard ball A hits billiard ball B and there's some chemical reaction that occurs in billiard ball B that then causes it to have momentum to roll away. Now you can test that if you're doing hypothesis testing. You can always test this uh, in that kind of, of science. But even if you prove that, which is not true, but even if you prove that, then someone can come along and say, okay, the chemical reaction occurs, in the, but there's something else in the middle. No matter how much you believe that A causes B, you can always insert C in the middle. And there's no way around this. You know, it's logic. There's no way around that. So you can never prove negative, and you can never really prove anything. You can, get, you can have confidence, but you can't prove it. Um, another problem is that there are unresolvable inconsistencies in, in science, certainly in mathematics, and a lot of science is based on mathematics. And you might be familiar with the, the name Kurt Gödel, uh, Gödel's uh, theorem, which is very famous in, in uh, mathematics, basically proves that all mathematical systems are internally inconsistent. You can't prove from within a system that it is consistent. You have to step outside of it to prove that. Therefore, there has to be some greater system that explains it. Now, these are like really deep uh, philosophy of science type points, but they're logical and they're real.
I mean, you, you cannot get around these things. So science is as much faith as religion. Scientists don't think of it that way in a day-to-day -day, uh, world. And people that use science to defend their point of view don't understand it. You know, how often have we heard follow the science in recent years? Follow the science is one of the stupidest things I've ever heard anyone say. You can't, it, that's, that's it. If no scientist would say that, it flies in the face of the scientific method. You never follow the science. You question the science. You constantly question the science. Because we know that it sits on shaky ground. So, with that in mind, let's return to this concept of the, the, you know, the original point, the impossibility of your existence. The atheist says, there's no place for God in this. You know, this, is, this is silly. Um, it's random events, and random events have produced you, and you're here, so therefore there's a 100% probability that you're here, and that's just the result of random occurrences. There's no proof for God's existence, according to the atheist. So go away and stop trying to insert your God into my faith in science. Okay. I reply to that, prove it. You can no more prove your random event hypothesis, your deus ex machina, then I can prove that the hand of God was involved in those events. It's impossible. You can't even prove that something's random. You, you can't even have confidence that something is random. Well, I shouldn't say that. You can have confidence, but it's not actually very high confidence. And this gets into how do you prove something's random, and that's difficult. Um, you know, you might not know this, but your random number generators that people use, like when they do drawings for, uh, those numbers aren't actually random. They can't be. Um, it just goes back to how they're generated. There's no way to write an algorithm that generates truly random numbers. It comes close. You know, it comes close, but it's, 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 not, it's not actually really random. So, you know, I have nothing against people that choose to not believe in God. I, I really don't. If, if that's your choice, fine. Uh, but stop trying to force that on other people because of science, because your, your argument's flawed. You've got no ground to stand on. Atheism is as much a religion as Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, it, it's it's just true, you know. <laughs> you, you have faith in your atheism. And it's interesting. I know a lot of Christian scientists. I know uh, several Jewish scientists, faithful Jews, faithful Christians, uh, a fair number of faithful Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims. And they all do good science. You know, they're all top notch. And when I have the opportunity, I like to talk to them about religion because it gives me a better understanding of how they fit that into their day to day work. And, you know, usually it, it comes down to there's always going to be something we don't understand. And that's where there's room for God. Um, Evolution is a great example of this, you know, that evolution slash creationism is sort of the holy land in the war between the atheists and, and the, the, the theists. You know, the, the, the atheists look at evolution as their sort of flagship argument, you know, clearly evolution, you know, Darwin's theory is what explains our, our existence, you know, we evolved from animals and the animals evolved from uh, single-celled organisms, and that all occurred in this early primordial soup that just kind of randomly put together a cell. And okay, you know, and, and yeah, there's evidence for that. If you look at the fossil record, you can you can sort of draw lines, and 
Darwin did some beautiful observational work saying, you know, if this thing exists, how, how did this thing come to exist? It's so unusual. You know, like the, I'm thinking of the, there's a bird that has an incredibly long beak uh, that feeds on a particular flower, and it's the only bird that can feed on that flower uh, for the nectar from the flower because it's the only bird that can get to it because it's very deep down inside. And, you know, he looked at that and said, well, how, you know, how did this come to be? Now, the, the, the believer would say, well, God made it that way. But Darwin wanted, wanted you know, hard science behind it, and he came up with evolution. You know, this idea that there's random variation, and through that random variation, some mutations, what we'd call them now, will die off because they're not fit to the environment, and others will survive because they're more fit to the environment. Survival of the fittest, you've certainly heard that. Now, most believers look at that and say, well, you know, it's, it's the hand of God. And there's this made up argument between creationists and evolutionary uh, thinkers. And I say made up because sure, there are believers that say, you know, the world was made in exactly seven days, which that's not what the Bible says. It says seven epochs of time. And, uh, you know, there's, there's no room for evolution. It has to be creationism. Um, everything was done by God. You know, God crafted each individual animal perfectly in, in, in his mind and, and, and set it down. And, and that's it. Okay. Um, and then you got the hardcore evolutionists that say, oh, no, it's all evolution. No, no, no room for it. But most people are in the middle where they'll look at it the way I look at it. Evolution seems to be a, a, a correct theory. It seems to be an appropriate theory. It's hard to test it, but it makes sense. And evolution may be, if you're a believer, is the mechanism by which God chose to create the world. And that resolves, there's no argument there. You know, because the scientist, the, the, the atheist cannot tell me what the mechanism is other than, well, it's random variation. Well, I'm saying it's not random variation, it's the hand of God. We have faith in one or the other. So the truth is you can decide to be a believer or you can decide to be a non-believer and you can make sense of the world in either way. But in both cases, you have faith. In both cases, there's a God coming out of the machine. And you should be aware of that. As I've said many times, uh, the things that the things that we agree on, the things that we hold in common, outnumber the things that we disagree on. Whether this be religion, politics, in science, there's people that disagree on, you know, I have a theory, you have a theory. But the things that we agree on outnumber those differences. And that's where we find our strength as, as a people. And we have to keep that in mind. So don't attack someone because they are a believer in something you don't believe. Don't disregard them and think that they're stupid because they believe something that you don't believe. Most people aren't stupid. Most people think about their beliefs. Now, they may not think about them enough. You know, we can always think more. We can always challenge ourselves more. Challenge what we believe. Don't be afraid to read a book about another religion or read a book about atheism. Don't be afraid if you're an atheist to read a book about Christianity or Judaism. Challenge your beliefs. Test your hypothesis. That's the most important thing, that we are standing on ground that is firm enough that we can defend what we believe and realize that there are assumptions and we could be wrong. So that concludes this three-part series that I never intended to be a three-part series. I hope you found some 
<laughs> some entertainment in that, and maybe maybe some food for thought. I'm gonna get myself off uh, to enjoy this beautiful Sunday. I plan to do very little today. Just gonna rest a bit, enjoy some uh, some good food. I hope, and because uh, I'm hoping my wife makes some, <laughs> and probably have a few more balls of haunted bookshop before the day is out. I hope your week is off to a great start. Enjoy the rest of the week. I'll, Wednesdays are hit and miss these days because I'm going to work and stuff, but uh, we'll see what happens. But I'll definitely be back on Friday with a new uh, virtual pipe club, Friday night, 8 p.m. Eastern. I hope you join us. It's always a good time. And with that, my friends, I'm going to say goodbye. So until we speak again, I look forward to talking to you all again very soon. Goodbye now. Mm -hmm.